Hey, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we are joined for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with James Walker. James is the CEO of Nano Nuclear Energy. James, I appreciate your time. Thanks for being here. No worries. Hey, thanks for having me, JD. So first, let's start with a base definition for any of our listeners who might be a bit unfamiliar. James, what is micro reactor technology and how does it differ from traditional nuclear reactors? Okay, so uh, within the industry, there's really the, the two big things people talk about at the moment are small modular reactors and micro reactors. So um, if you think of a micro reactor, it's classified as really anything beneath about 20 megawatts of power being outputted whereas a small modular reactor is 20 megawatts above. And I think the largest uh, small modular reactor I've seen is 480. So let's just say small modular, small modular reactors run from 20 megawatts all the way up to almost 500 megawatts. But in the, in the traditional uh, big power plants that you're talking of, the, the enormous things, those, those, those things sort of, they border on about a one gigawatt of output power. So. Uh, so it sounds as if, as far as you're situated, the smaller the better. Is that a, a good way to read the the situation? Look, you're not you're not wrong. Like when we when we started in this, like um, obviously there was a lot of development in small modular reactors. They're they're the ones you read about mostly in the news. But we saw that actually with a micro reactor, you could target a potentially much larger market, and there was less competition. And um, it was also targeting areas where there was no other fuel competition from other sources. So. Say, for instance, if you make a small modular reactor and it powers a town, you still might have to compete with the price at the grid of uh, for gas, for coal, for wind, for solar, for geothermal. But for micro reactors, if you're putting it in mining sites remote uh, for remote industry, for oil and gas, for um, military bases, island communities, all these different areas where micro reactors would go where an SMR is unsuitable, then you're only competing with the costs of remote diesel. And that's usually quite expensive because... Say you're running um, a diesel generator in just the middle of nowhere, um, the, the importation costs add significantly to that. So all we've got to do then is compete with the costs of remote diesel. And in the micro reactor market, there were fewer um, big competitors who had developed systems for that. So we saw that with the right financing structure and the right technical teams, this was an area we could pull ahead in and you know, um, hopefully get a commercial product out first and dominate that market. To the point of that commercial product, what are some of the potential markets that you see for your micro reactors? Are there particular industries or regions that you see as being most promising for your deployment? Well, certainly when we started, we knew that mining would be a big one because um, there's actually probably thousands of sites that are um, that have that are very mineral rich or resource rich, but they're not economic to uh, to exploit, and that's because. <clears throat> the fuel costs alone make the deposit uneconomic. Now, if you were to have a constant fuel supply in this kind of area, then you could unlock a lot of economic potential. But a lot of existing mines also could really benefit from this. So process heat for concentrating ore for accommodations. Um, so, but that, but that basically leads in from, from mining into remote oil and gas, remote industry in general. And then as we were building into this, uh, into this industry, we saw that actually... Um, there's a huge potential market in island communities. So when we spoke to governments in Philippines, Indonesia, Thailand, um, there were hundreds of millions of people dotted across hundreds of islands. Um, and they, and these, these communities all basically subsisted off diesel generators. And this, was, uh, this meant an intermittent power, it was polluting, and it meant um, very high costs. And this is another massive area where microactors can move into. And you could you could make that similar argument in um, the continent of Africa as, as an example, where they've got large um, population centers that have no power. And it's just not feasible to run power transmission lines to these areas. But if you do uh, put a micro reactor into these locations, you can have vertical farms, you can have mining communities and power for industry and desalination plants. And so there's, as I say, you could make 100,000 of these things a year and you still probably wouldn't hit the potential of the market. So. Uh, James, I hope you don't mind the next question. I always ask a CEO in your situation how closely you follow the stock price. Anyone who by now in our interview has bothered to look up ticker symbol NNE at the NASDAQ seems that nanonuclear energy is up some 262% year to date. Talk to me about what you attribute the overall market cap of the company rising so significantly too. And then to my main question, how often do you track stock price for your company day to day? 
You know, it's it's a funny thing because I try and not look because the problem is that like there's there's so much action in the stock that if you yeah. could just watch it, you could just watch it go up and down and then you're going to lose a lot of time. And I've got so much to do that like I just don't want to get distracted by it. And like sometimes I do fall for the, the habit of looking in the morning and it's it's obviously doing something exciting. And I, it makes you want to come back every 15 minutes and have a look. So like the, the, the habit is to try and not look and maybe at the end of the day, I might clock in and just see what it's done. But the, the sometimes, you know, it might, there's, there's days where it's jumped like $5 and then people are calling you and, be like, and, and telling you. And so you get roped into the whole looking thing. So I, I, do try, I do try and avoid it, but sometimes you just can't help yourself. Um, Fair enough. I feel like if, if those of us who are not CEOs have our own portfolios and we fall victim to checking in day to day, I can only imagine what it's like for your position. So thanks for letting me ask that. And I appreciate a bit of context. And again, the, the, the growth for the company's value that we've seen since the start of the year is uh, obviously significantly outpacing the market many times over. So uh, congrats on how things have gone there. Uh, talk to me about the key challenges, games that you feel like you face when developing or deploying your own advanced portable nuclear reactors. What are those headwinds and challenges look like? And how are you addressing those challenges? So, I mean, the, the good part is now we're into a new set of challenges. So say when you relaunch the company, the issue is like, who the hell are you? <laughs> you know, why should we take your design seriously? You know, are you really going to do this? Um, are you credible? I mean, these are a lot of challenges you get when you, you launch a nuclear energy company because, you know, there is, it's a very complicated device. It's a, it's a complicated industry with, and there's big players in it. There's the Iranos of the world, the Urenkos of the world. Are you going to be competing with these guys? But um, so as you as you develop, you do need to win credibility. And we've we've done a lot of that through. We've got some of the best scientists in the world to join the company, too. And we've we've made sure that the design work we have done, um, we've had it externally audited and we've taken it often to the national labs. And we said, take this apart, um, you know, try and find fault with what we're doing here. Uh, these little challenges here that we've sort of we're doing. So we have industry credibility and people want to join us. And I think we're in that position now where we do have that credibility and we're pro maybe in the micro reactor space, we're the, one of the most credible players in there. Um, and now we're moving into the challenge of we're, we're through a lot of design work, we're into the big stuff now. So we're doing physical test work, irradiation of salts, building rigs, finding sites to build prototypes, finding sites to build fabrication facilities and fuel facilities. So you're getting into the big stuff now. And in that case, you need, you need to raise significant capital. And I think... This week, we've just closed a raise for about $40 million because, um, you know, the market's on our side. So, you know, it's it's uh, different challenges as they arise, but like there's always something, you know, I I, I end up, I don't even, I've got small kids, I, I barely even see them because <laughs> I spend most of my time just navigating these big challenges. So. Well, congrats on that big raise. Uh, James, there have been a lot of recent investments into nuclear energy from a lot of big household names, the big tech players, the Amazons, the Googles, the Microsofts in the world. What impact do you see their involvement being on the nuclear energy landscape and how things might change as a result? Oh, look, it's it's very, very positive. I'm really pleased they're piling into this. And like, um, to I mean, to explain why, they don't really have a choice. They know that they're going to plateau in terms of what energy they require and um they, the, the sophistication of their AI, their AI models, the capacity of their data centers, they need a lot of power and they need a lot of power over the next few years. And if they don't get that, you know, AI doesn't sophisticate any further. Mm -hmm. The data centers don't have any more capacity and their, their business gets essentially damaged. So and um, nuclear gives them an ability to have a high baseload power which they need um, and they can site it anywhere and it's and it's clean. And so. Um, obviously, them piling into the industry is great because it brings a lot of money and it actually makes it a very unique point in nuclear energy's history because it's happening at the same time as the government is also panicking about um, building back its nuclear power. So you're seeing the DOE this year putting billions of dollars back into building domestic infrastructure to support this sort of resurgent nuclear industry. But combined with the tech industry also pouring money into it, um, it's it's meant like there's there's a lot of investment that's looking to go into nuclear and obviously that's going to be very beneficial for companies like ours where we we are building very very quickly um and so yeah I, i'm i'm obviously very very pleased so, so i mean 
to someone listening and learn about this stuff for the first time, it seems as if you're almost positioning your company as a bit of an AI play, right? I mean, not, not a direct one, but if you, you're talking about the biggest names in the world building their own uh, large language models, their own chatbots, their own AI, whatever it is, fill in the blank here, there needs to be a lot of energy. I mean, is that kind of how you view your positioning for nano nuclear energy relative to the broader AI revolution we're seeing? Yeah, you know, it's it's when we started, we didn't anticipate this sort of AI revolution, the sort of going into nuclear. But because it's happened, obviously, you know, fantastic. We'll 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 deploy reactors that can cater to some of this market too. And the good thing about micro reactors is that it's some some parts of this AI revolution and, and involvement in nuclear are so particularly suited to what we do over the bigger reactors, like edge computing, where you need these sort of mobile um, plants and, and mobile data centers and mobile units because um, and, and be able to move them around a lot. These th these this type of edge computing is just not suited towards SMRs, which are very large and big fixed installations. So if we get products out there, we'll be able to cater to the whole of that as well. And so that's very likely to be a big component of this involve of the tech industry's involvement in nuclear. And it's it's wide open. It's wide open for us to cater to it and provide that power for this edge computing uh, part of the AI and data center um, intra uh, like big industry boost. So. You mentioned a few minutes ago the U.S. Department of Energy. Tell me more about what that relationship looks like working with the Department of Energy and, and how I wonder you might be positioning yourself for a potential change in administration after the presidential election, which with it could bring an entirely new set of energy policies. So it's interesting because the Department of Energy this year has put out some, some big RFPs. So um, billions of dollars for enrichment, billions of dollars for deconversion, um, and also funding opportunities for reactors, for transportation, for all these different areas. And the reason why they've done this is that in the past, the U.S. was sourcing a lot of its uranium from Russia, like weapons grade material from Russia, and it was down blending it to meet its domestic needs. And actually what's happened is that obviously that supply chain is now very much in jeopardy. But the, the industry in the States needs to be built back. And even the Department of Defense knows that uh, if it doesn't, if it's not able to manufacture its own uranium and it and the um, source from Russia completely stops, then the, the military won't actually have um, uranium for uh, past the 2030s. And that means no aircraft carriers, no submarines. So there's this big pressure on the DOE to build back that infrastructure. Um, so obviously they're, they're, they're throwing money at the at the problem as well. So obviously, again, like that's why it's a very unique time. It's, it's sort of like um, tech industry is worried and the at, at the national level is worried, too. And with regard to the, the change in administration, nuclear energy has ended up being one of the very few um, uh, industries that's uh, and, and, and policies and issues which has bipartisan support. So recently there was there were votes. Um, I think it was like 78 to two. Uh, in favor of the Advance Act and, and nuclear reforms that would benefit the industry. And that was both sides of the aisle. So that's, even if there's a change of administration, we can be pretty confident that neither administration has a choice. They, they have to back nuclear and they have to continue with these policies. James Walker is the CEO of Nano Nuclear Energy. That is ticker symbol NNE trades at the NASDAQ market site in Times Square in New York. James, appreciate your perspective. Congratulations on all the success and best of luck. Okay, no, thanks a lot, JD.